<laughs> Your uh, avatar. Was, Alba's yeah. avatar is a goth stuffy. That's with right. Bat wings with pierced bat that's, wings. It's pretty awesome. That's bonus. So welcome everybody to this presentation of Modern Mudras for Horizon Lodge, Order Templi Orientis. Uh, we are really excited to be doing this. I uh, wanted to shout out in the chat room, we have the link to our donation link. Um, so we're doing this class 100% for donations. Jim is donating all of his time and knowledge to this endeavor on our behalf and we're really appreciative of that. Um, I'm having some difficulty with my copy paste function for the other links I was going to share with you. So if there are any other Horizon members out there who have a link to our email list or our YouTube channel or our Facebook and would like to contribute those to the chat window, uh, we can, would love to make those available to everybody. Uh, and also, um, I will follow up after this class with a link to the handout that is available via Drive. You won't need it necessarily to uh, learn from this presentation, um, but you might want it for afterwards so you can follow up and remember all the cool stuff that Jim taught us today. So um, are we ready to jump in on the deck, Jim? I'm ready. All right. So Melissa is going to be running the deck, so I might need to let her know when to advance. Right. So welcome everyone to Modern Mudras. Um, palmistry for the current age. Ooh. Uh, this is a amalgamation of 30 plus years of my own experience in being a professional palm reader. And uh, Melissa and I um, wanted to do this before the um, global pandemic happened. We were planning on doing this live at the lodge for everybody. Um, but then after I watched the mass on Facebook, I thought, Melissa, why don't we just do this over Zoom and invite everyone? So came together and here we are. So I'm super excited that you guys are, that you all are here. So thanks for being here. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, that's me. That's a better picture than you see now, I think. Um, I have been reading palms since I was 16 years old, professionally, since I was 16. Although my first palm reading was when I was just an 11 year old kid, finding a pamphlet in my grandparents' attic. Um, and over the years, finding um, the methodology of palmistry to be very uh, problematic in many ways, I developed my own method of palmistry that I call the divine hand method. And from that also came this idea of these modern mudras. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I own the Divine Hand Palmistry, which is my business for providing readings and also teaching palmistry to the general public. I live uh, on Capitol Hill here in Seattle with my husband and partner, and I'm a stepdad and grandpa, two super cute little people. <laughs> <laughs> who are you, Melissa? Uh, who am I? This is, whoop, I apparently am moving too fast. All right, so this is me. Uh, my name is Melissa. A lot of you on this call, I think, already know who I am, but I uh, wanted to shout out that I've been an OTO initiate and Horizon Lodge member since 2002. I'm a surprise late addition to the presentation piece of this class because when we were talking about what the content and we started talking about some of the hand symbols and things that we find, particularly in our Gnostic mass, uh, we wanted to add me in, so as he's, Jim is going to look at some of those symbols later on in the presentation, we can, I can provide a little bit of perspective on it from an OTO position. Um, I've known Jim for years. I don't even remember when I met Jim. Yeah, I don't either. Pagan event in years and years and years ago. Um, but I've been talking to him for a while about seeing a mass and um, it took a pandemic and live streaming to actually do it a couple weeks ago. So it was pretty exciting. Um, so without further ado, uh, before we jump in on content, Jim, one point of housekeeping. We have a, a kind of intimate group. We are nine people on the call total at this time. Um, how do you want to handle questions? And You know, if in the chat function, when, when you click on chat, there's a little... Oh, uh, well, there should be. Uh, you have the, to raise hand. 
Yeah, I thought there was a raised hand, but I don't I'm see it now. I'm not seeing it in this okay. call. I'm not sure why. I think if you ask a question in the chat, um, Melissa or I can help moderate it, moderate that, and um, we will. Oh, it's in participants. Okay, right. Thank you. So if you click on the participants button, um, yeah, there's raise hand. But I think um, it, so. It is fun to do that and actually unmute, and then we can unmute you from participants, and you can ask the question live. You can also chat your question to us, and so either way is fine. Right, Melissa, do you have a preference yeah. one way or the uh, other? I think that's fine. I think we can just um, kind of play it by ear as we go. I, you know, sometimes I guess raise hand might be hard to see. I don't know. I don't know. We'll experiment with it. And if you're not getting us, if you're not getting our attention through raising hands, then chat something and just start, just start jumping up and down in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> also, I need to pause and thank Kellen for putting up those links I asked for. Thank you, Kellen. Yay, Kellen. Right. Okay, so let's start with what is a mudra? So a mudra is a Sanskrit word um, shared with many uh, Eastern and South Asian um, languages for a seal, a mark, or a gesture. Um, and it indicates an energetic seal of authenticity. It's employed with iconography. So just like in the Greek, uh, like you'll see the same statue, the same Greek sort of form, and you won't really know whether it's Demeter or Hecate, unless you see like, is that female figure carrying a shaft of wheat or carrying a torch, right? So these attributes, in um, many Asian and South Asian cultures, it's the hand gesture that indicates whether the Buddha is the Buddha of teaching or the Buddha of peace or these sort of things, or whether the Tara is one Tara versus another. So we see these mudras employed in iconography, and spirit, but it's also employed in spiritual practice. Um, for instance, in yoga, you can um, put your own hands in, and your actual body in different positions and in, 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 invoke an energetic vibe, um, an energetic state of being with your hand gestures or with your body gesture. And so in yoga and in other spiritual and in meditation, you can do these sorts of things. And so this is the idea of a mudra and it's in Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and, and several others. Um, and I put this in here because I wanna be very clear that I'm not using the word mudra with the um, long uh, with the U with the slash over it. Um, that is really something that is from a culture which I am not a part of. And I'm honoring that and inspired by that culture with um, and taking that into something that we observe in our Western culture. So a modern mudra on the next slide is applying modern observations to the hand gestures we see in North American culture is really what I'm focusing on, although it can work for we most of Western culture as a way to understand our unconscious motivations. So different from a, an Eastern mudra, which has centuries of cultural significance and spiritual significance, this we're using the word, I'm using the word in this sense of saying, how do we use that idea that when I make an un a gesture, I'm actually accessing a metaphysical slash unconscious energetic um, intent with my hands. So it's blending the social science, the psychology and metaphysics together or magic together. So let's start out. So feel free to unmute yourself because I would love this to be a popcorn verbalization. Maybe um, Melissa is the host. She can unmute everybody or you can unmute, unmute yourself. Everyone. But I'm super curious, um, what are your perceptions? What do you think are the common perceptions or misperceptions of palmistry that are out there in the world? What are some common sort of things that people believe about palmistry? Well, I think in the modern paradigm, the, the most obvious one is the fortune teller, the person who's going to tell you your future by looking at your hand. Yeah, so it's focused, it's selling the future. That's a great one. What else? 
-hmm. Any other perceptions on palmistry from people? You're unmuted, we can hear you. I always think, in, particularly like in what John was referencing in the media, is they're always kind of seen as a slick, maybe charlatan mm -hmm. type figure that isn't necessarily. Yeah, maybe low, maybe low energy, maybe like, you know, there's a little bit of this. Uh, and actually, in modern times, even just even today, there are people who use palmistry as to con others, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's go through some of the ones that I have here. And you can mute everyone again if you want, Melissa, except for I'll wait because I might get muted then. You might. How do I? Participants, mute all. Mute and all. then unmute Jim. Oh, you're unmuted. Mute all. Current, yes, it's giving me silly things. And then I unmute Jim. Yeah, yay. Okay. So here are some perceptions that I pick up on. So the first one is, go Melissa, fatalistic doom and gloom, like John, John said, right? Uh, telling you your future or it's something is set and it tends to be a little bit negative. Uh, if you have this line, then you're fated to, you know, the suicide thumb or the murderers, the murderer's thumb or the suicide line, or if you have the health line, you're gonna suffer from terrible health, things like that. The next one, makes predictions, it tells the future, and those predictions are often unavoidable. The next one, unchangeable. A lot of times people think that if it's in my hand, I can't change it because it's in my hand. The next one, it's low energy or it's a negative sort of thing or it, it tends to focus on negative things. Next slide, I think. So here's the reality of palmistry. The reality is, go Melissa. Sorry. <laughs> That palmistry reveals our highest and best selves. It, rather than being low energy, it reveals patterns. Oh no, you're fine, just go through. <laughs> it shows patterns, reveals our best selves. Our hands are always changing. They don't stay the same. As we move and exercise and change jobs and change our stress patterns and other things, our hands will change. The musculoskeletal uh, structures change all the time. And finally, it's inspirational and it's empowering. So palmistry, if done well, is inspirational. Um, not low energy, not negative, and not fatalistic. Unfortunately, that's not usually the reality of most people's style of palmistry. So let's teach you guys some of these foundations so that you can look at hand positions and hand gestures in a whole new way. And you'll be able to do this um, even watching the news, don't watch the news. Um, but if you decide to get a little depressed and watch the news, at least you can analyze their hand gestures and, you know, or anything else that you might see. So let's start out with this first slide. So the, what's the difference between the right palm versus the left palm? And this is true even if you're a left-handed person because our uh, society is very, for all you lefties out there, you know this more than us right-handed people, um, the world is a right-handed world, right? And, and even I just said, right? So when I say and in indicate, isn't that correct? I say, right. So this dominant idea of right being correct and left being sinister, and from the Italian word for left, sinistra. So this, these ideas are very much ingrained in our culture. So the left palm is our internal expression, our private life, things that are internal to us. So if something shows up on that left hand, it's, it's going to be indic indicative of things that are happening in our personal private life. The right hand is our public life, our external expression. If something shows up there, it's us at work or at school. If something is on our left hand, it's going to be at home or in personal relationships. Sometimes you could see the right hand as a little bit more the yang side and the left hand left hand is a little bit more of the yin side. Um, that isn't always the case. You don't have to have that dichotomy. I like to think of it as um, more like the sun sign versus your uh, moon sign or your rising sign, like those two sides of 
this is how I am sort of internally or like retrograde type of energy versus direct energy. So those are the kind of comparisons that I like to make with the right hand and the left hand. Full moon versus new moon, that type of thing. Again, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll go through them. So right hand, left hand. You guys got that so far? Great. So now let's talk about the fingers. So we have the right hand and the left hand. How do we look at the fingers? So right now, even before we look at any of the labels, I hope you all can see the planets on the fingers, right? And so we have the seven, oh, not yet. We not have yet. the seven planets that are there. Um, and those are those traditional planets and they show up on the hand. We're gonna talk about six of those planets. We're not gonna talk about the moon because, it, but I'll just say here, if there was a sixth finger, it would be a lunar finger and it would come from the mount of the moon and it would be a very strange finger. It would be associated with things that were strange, things that were um, esoteric, things that, that are associated with lunar energy, like uh, hyper, um, uh, empathic or uh, psychic, things like that. So that's um, a very interesting sort of mount, but since most people don't have six fingers and most people that have them, have them removed, we're gonna skip that planet for this presentation. Okay, so let's start with the index finger. I hope you all see that that's Jupiter down there. I associate Jupiter with power, agency, leadership, and sovereignty. So Jupiter, or I also think of the Greek variant of that is Zeus, king of the gods. And I really think about how we use that finger in society. So if you think about, this is a mantra that I have for palmistry, what you use the fingers for is what the finger means in palmistry. What you use the finger for is what it means in palmistry. So what do you use that index finger for? You use it to direct to lead, to put power on someone, right? So if I point at you and I say, Melissa, you're gonna be, you're gonna probably use another finger in response and it's probably not gonna be the index finger, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and we'll talk about why you would use that, right? So if I put my power on you by pointing, if I say, and I would want you to use that finger, if you were like, there's a fire in the building, there's the exit, please direct me, right? Jupiter is also associated with expansion and luck or um, expansion. We often, if we're gonna dig something or if we're gonna explore, we're always gonna use that finger. That's the finger that we're, you know, our ancient ancestors were finding, you know, honey or grubs or food or picking things. So this is always um, a very, our index finger is, you know, indexing things. So it's a very, it's a primary finger and so it is the planet Jupiter. Okay, middle finger. So Melissa will respond to me using my index finger on her with the middle finger of Saturn, which is, which is about rules, laws, limits, ethical constructs. So I have violated a, an unspoken rule or ethical boundaries by saying, Melissa, do this thing. And in our modern society, that's really not cool. And she would be like, no, <laughs> right? She would lift her middle finger to indicate that I have violated an unspoken, yeah, exactly. She would, right? I have um, violated an unspoken rule or boundary that she has. And maybe it's a little more spoken these days. Anytime that someone breaks a rule or breaks like a rule, a, a, an ethic of the of driving, for instance, you'll see that people will use this finger. Isn't that interesting that we raise that finger in those in those states? Um, what else is there? Any other things that Saturn means to you guys, to you all? So if there's other things that Saturn um, put it in the chat, what are the other associations that you have with Saturn? Um, those are things that you would also want to include as you were. Oops, I think I was muted there for a minute. You were muted for a second, sorry. That yeah, so, yeah. As, as you're looking at someone's hand, you can add, don't just use my associations. The planet is there, that's 
not changeable, but what, what is associated with the planet, that's me. I would invite you to say, I really associate Jupiter with these things. That's what's gonna give you as a palm reader um, your own flavor, right? And you associate Saturn and Saturn with these things, right? So those unique things that you would associate these planets with, that's what you'll wanna use, not just hook, line, and sinker with what Jim Barker says that these planets mean. Some people are much better, a strong, much better at these archetypes than I am with boundaries. So John says, with boundaries and form. Yeah, I love that. So if someone is really having an issue with boundaries and form, oh, and Alba says karma. So if you associate Saturn with karma, that's very interesting that you say that. We're not going to talk about the lines, but your fate line often originates under Saturn and continues down your, your palm. So it's very much aligned with that. That's a more advanced topic than we're going to talk about. But yeah, so how someone is using that finger can be associated with that. OK, let's see what the sun finger. Well, there you go. Exactly. See, you, you are already, you are all already amazing palm readers. You just didn't know it. We're just going to reveal it within you. So the ring finger is the sun. It's called the Apollo finger, but I really like calling it by the planet, the sun. Um, and I, that I really see as ego, self-esteem, self-projection, self-image. What is our light in the world? How do we shine? How do we show up? So how do we use that finger in modern society? Well, this is where we adorn ourselves, right? We put um, you know, rings on that. It's our ring finger. This is where we show our status, where we show up, where we flash, right? And so this minor type, this a little bit minor action we take with that finger is really reflective of what the planetary association is with that finger. Other things that you'd associate with the sun, put them in the chat. I really see it as these things. Anything you'd add to that, Melissa? What do you associate with the sun? Oh my gosh. Well, in Thalema, the sun is a really big deal. Um, it is associated with, um, especially to what you've said here, the ego with the self. We have um, Tippereth on the Tree of Life is the center where the Holy Garden Guardian Angel resides and our the great work is attaining that knowledge and conversation. Um, Lord visible and sensible, as is stated in the Collex, in the Mass, Lord secret. Mm. The sun is a really deep subject for us. So there's wow. things that these folks are probably con contribute on that. Okay, I think we need to geek out and do like a thalamic palmistry like what would the limit i think john is smiling so what does the limit <laughs> palmistry look like so john and melissa and i um had a lot of fun was it last year or a year and a half ago and we did palmistry at um at a restaurant over brunch and john blew my mind we just totally came together with some very interesting nuances into my own palmistry method after having a conversation with john and melissa because the lemma, I think, brings some very fascinating and exacting and detailed perspectives on a lot of these ideas that I have more just sort of general sort of, you know, but oh my gosh, how cool would it be to sort of structure this a little more and have some, you know, oh my God, that would be so cool. Okay, I digress. I think we should do it. Well, we are digressing. <laughs> okay, that was a fun digression. Okay, let's talk about the pink A, the orange, pinky, mercury. Um, I colored this orange because I associate that with Mercury, um, but I see this as communication, self-expression. So, and I see that whenever someone is holding like a, an object and their pinky's out or whenever someone's pinky is out, it's really indicative of someone that wants to talk to you. If you see someone with their drink and they're holding their pinky out, probably they're going to talk your ear off. Um, and that's just a gesture, this pinky, you know, when pinkies are out, they're often a talkative person or they're in a state of communication. Um, it's not, it's not so much in our society um, about the pinky. Um, pinky rings are sometimes a thing for, and it's often associated with people that are a little bit flashy. And so that's a little bit mercurial. You often find that people who wear pinky rings 
do seem to be a little bit mercurial, slick, you know, it's associated with like, you know, a little bit the Italian, you know, the Italian guy with his shirt unbuttoned and, you know, like, I'm it's looking at my husband. You can say it. It's a stereotype. I'm looking at my husband. Okay. You're Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so John says, uh, the pinky is important to musical expression. People who are skilled with music must develop their motor skills in this digit. Yes, exactly. If you can't get that guitar string pressed down hard enough, it'll vibrate weird or you won't get that note, right? Or if you're playing violin or any other instrument that requires, or piano, if you can't hit that pinky, you know, key with as much strength as you can hit it with your middle finger or your thumb, you know, your piano playing, anything that you're using your hands for. So yeah, developing that pinky is huge. So John must have really developed pinky muscles. I'd also like, just as a fun fact, to point out that the origin of the pinky out while drinking is a, is a, a symptom of syphilis, that your pinky would get rigid. <laughs> so people would in order to be like cool and, and would mock it whether they had syphilis or not because all mm. important people had syphilis apparently so yeah weird side note again <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's look at the thumb so the last one we'll look at is that thumb oh john says it allowed nobility to hide the fact that they had syphilis got it yeah oh yeah Interesting. Thanks i'm gonna have that. to look that up yeah. All right. So Venus, Mars. Um, so this is a very interesting finger because the plane of Mars is across the thumb in that sort of triangular shaped, kind of a speedo shaped, you know, uh, across the middle of the palm. And then it continues along that side of the thumb. And then the, the mount of Venus and then is there on the pad of the thumb and then continues up the other side of the thumb. So if we think about what the thumb does, the thumb is the primary grasping digit, right? It has enormous strength, um, you know, and with the thumb, we're able to grasp very heavy objects and hold on um, to them. And so, in fact, the thumb is so powerful, you can really, I could just read, th do thumb readings and pretty much read a person just from looking at their thumb alone. The thumb has two planetary associations, Venus and Mars. And so this indicates our actions, our ability to desire something and then take the physical action towards that. So that back and forth of Venus and Mars, because Venus and Mars or Aphrodite and Aries are actually doing it, aren't they? Much to Hephaestus's frustration, they are doing it. And that's this thumb is the doer. It is indica indicative of, if the thumb is out, it's indicative of being able to take action. Our opposable thumb is what makes lets us do things. And there's also this idea of will. So if you look at palmistry, uh, statuary, or drawings, they always put will on the thumb. And so Melissa and I geeked out on this on the next slide about will and a note about this. So on the Venus side, this is the Venus, the yin, the desire, or the water earth side, or the love side of the thumb. And on the Mars side, this is lower or yeah, lower Mars on this side. And this is the yang, the inspiration, the fire air side, and the war side of the thumb. And this is this dichotomy back and forth of being able to take action. So does this remind you of anything? Does this dichotomy, this back and forth, this two sort of thing remind you of anything? Anyone? Bueller? to remind you of anything, anyone? Anyone? Okay, go. You can. All right, well, it makes me, it reminds me of, of, um, of chaos and um, the top, the pillars, the interplay, the um, Babylon and the beast, that whole idea of we've got the, the force and fire, the rush of every, all the energy, of God and the containment therein. Um, that's what it reminds me of. Anyone want to add? I know you're all smart. Lots of thoughts out there. I think John's typing. 
Are they typing or do they want to talk? I don't see any. Maybe unmute everyone. I'll Let's unmute see. everybody. Okay, cool. That makes it easier. Yay. Because my typing is not that good. So it, I was thinking about Venus as the outside and the opening palm, the offering, the, the, um, the giving hand, and then Mars as the closing, the grasping hand which are associated with Yod and Kaf in the Tarot. Uh, Yod being um, uh, the Hermit, Kaf being the Wheel of Fortune. Um, I, again, that whole mechanical aspect to it that, that's really interesting. And, and the metaphysical relationship between the offering and the grasping. Yeah, that's awesome. One thing that Melissa that you can do is you can mute everyone and then everyone can press the space bar to speak. So the space bar will temporarily unmute you and then Jared's background noise or okay. anyone's background noise. We love you, Jared. You're just saying. <laughs> I'm anyone's gonna background call noise. for a second and then unmute you in a second, Jim. So hold on. La la la. Uh. Yeah, uh, and now, John, press your space bar. Yeah. Ooh. Isn't that cool? <laughs> now you can press your space bar and just any kind of questions you guys have. So you could, you a could, better way. Yeah. Okay, hit the next, advance that slide. I will. Yeah, see? Pillar. Oh, oh. pillars. So I keep going. Pillars. Okay, keep going. All right, <clears throat> so we talked about all of the fingers and their meanings, right? So we have Jupiter, Saturn, the Sun, Mercury, and Venus, Mars, right? Um, there we are, all five fingers. And now the fingers can do a few things, right? But I'm not gonna talk about adduction and abduction. I'm gonna more talk about flexion and extension. So the extended fingers are here on the left. The extended finger is it indicates expressive or active energy. I made up a word, extrospective, or it's this idea that the energy is outside and I'm looking at things outside of myself. The flexed finger is receptive, inactive, and introspective energy. One note here is there is nothing that is inherently negative. In fact, this is true of all of palmistry. There's nothing inherently negative in or positive in palmistry at all. There's not like, oh, you have this mark or you have this line and that's a bad thing or that's a good thing. Everything just is and then it's what you do with those things that's either helpful or not helpful or aligned to your will or not aligned to your will. So one of the big um, differences between the divine hand method of palmistry and other methods of palmistry is that I don't have this methodology that is like this is uh, inherently a good thing, a good mark, and this is inherently a bad mark. So when you see the fingers extended or flexed, it is simply, um, it, the question to ask is, is this in line with your will? And if it is, great, your, th your hands are expressing your will. If it's not, oh, what are we gonna do about that? Let's see the next slide. The uh, last part of this sort of rubric is that in the fingers, there's a proxy. Again, this is a proxy. This is not the actual chakras in the fingers. Your hands do have energy centers in them. Um, this is not what we're talking about but you can see where in the body people are holding energy, where, what someone is doing with their hand gesture, are they pinching, are they fiddling with the tip of their finger, are they massaging you know, this knuckle, that we can use this chart to understand what chakra that's related to in their body. And so we have the seven chakras and basically they line up um, on all the fingers, it's the base of the finger and halfway in between and then each of the knuckle lines 
and halfway in between. And so that's the basic idea here. On the thumb, it's a little bit different um, where it goes from the, where the thumb starts down here and then the seven go up. But it's, um, you gotta kind of feel where the thumb knuckle is and then count up from there. So that one's not exactly to scale. So that's the chakras and the finger. So one of the ways that I use this is if someone is slicing tomatoes and then they're like, ouch, oh, I cut myself. Uh, I always tell people, and you can do this, send me a picture on Facebook or Instagram um, on my divine hand palmistry or, or direct message me. And then I love being like, okay, well, let's just line up the rubric. So it's on your left hand, it's your heart chakra, it's on your ring finger, right? So left hand, is that your personal life or is it your public life? It's your personal life. That's right. And your ring finger is the planet associated with your ring finger is the sun. Sun, that's right. So it's your sun in your personal life. And what did I say? What chakra was it? Did I say? Let's say you cut yourself right here in your, in your solar plexus chakra, right? So you'd want to look at maybe personal power or balance in how you show up in your personal relationships. You had a little cut right there. And every time I do that for somebody, they're like, how did you know that? Oh my God, that's exact. It's like this amazing sort of thing. So you can totally do that just lining those things up. So you see how that works? Is that cool? It is. I have a question, Jim. I'm gonna, no. so here is a ring on my thumb. Yeah. What mean to you. Yeah, so rings on the fingers. So that is a whole another, where is it? Do I have that book? Rings, yeah. So I just bought this book. Can you read it? It's Rings really small. for the Fingers. George. Rings for the Fingers, right? By George Frederick Kuntz. So there is this whole thing about wearing rings on the fingers. What chakra is that, is that ring on? So let's, let's hold off on the thumbs because that's a little more of an advanced topic because uh, it depends, you know, where that chakra is. I'd have to feel where your knuckle is and then go up from there. But let's say you like to wear a ring um, like here. Some people like to wear rings like right there on their index finger. Have you seen someone with a thin wire ring on different or on their middle finger like here, right? You can see that that's around the heart chakra, right? Or I've even seen people wear a ring just below their fingernail, right? So that's their third eye chakra on that finger. Rings symbolize where someone wants support. So think of it like a foundation garment or like a corset, right? Where we're looking for partnership, support, uh, uh, collaboration. We wear our ring finger at our root chakra of the sun, of our ego. So the foundation of how I identify in my personal life, I wear a ring there because I'm inadvertently symbolizing I'm partnering with my identity in my personal life because I'm married. Isn't that funny? how that's a comfortable place to wear it. And that's what it's associated with in palmistry. I mean, I didn't make that up. It's just what I realized. I was like, oh my gosh. So if I wear a ring finger at the base of my index finger, I am probably looking for support or partnership or gaining support and partnership, perhaps if it's on my right hand in business, or if it's on my middle finger, perhaps it's support in the foundations of my ethics, rules, boundaries, or karma, right? So these are what you'd want to look at. And this is a way to sort of understand that. So if it's at the base of your thumb, it's either around your balance in the action, in your actions, in doing. So not doing too much, not going into workaholism, taking a break, reminding yourself that you need to chill the F out and like actually have downtime and spend time with family and with loved ones and things like that. Not that I would want to read your hands in front of everyone or anything, Melissa. Of course not. I think I gave you consent when I showed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but we can move on if this is a deep subject. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So is this cool for everybody? Alba thought this was super cool. I want to know, um, are people following? So let's do a check-in. So just press your space bar 
And if you have um, thoughts or if you're um, following me live, I'd love to know, are you picking up what we're laying down? So John says, the converse of reading these symbols is that it also provides an outline for making measures really, oh, that's so true. And think about how you could also decide what metal, do you wanna wear a lunar metal, like, like a silver on the finger of the sun? Do you wanna wear a gold on the finger of the sun? Do you need to amplify something? Do you wanna wear a hematite or, uh, or a labradorite or some other stone? What would that stone be doing on that finger for you. And so this is a whole realm of using this intentional, magical intention in crafting jewelry and deciding where you would wear it. There's only a few chakra points that a ring would naturally be comfortable on people. The thing that's really interesting is, this is what blows my mind. I think Alba will get off on this because of what she said earlier. You will wear a ring unconsciously because you because it's comfortable because that's what you need and that's what's cool what's cool is you can do it intentionally absolutely but it's also interesting for people that wear jewelry to be like why do i feel like wearing this ring today and why is it that some days maybe like with melissa's example she's like i do not want to wear this thumb ring today because it's hard she to open does daughters. Because she's like, I can't be restrained. I don't need this type of support these days, this day. What'd you say? If I need to open it, I need to open jars. This makes it really hard to open jars. Right. Um, so Jared asked, do false nails adornments play into this as well? I think that um, false nails I see can change someone, um, how they use their hands. And so that changes how I read hands when people have very long nails. It changes what how they're using their hands and then it changes the way I read it. Um, but other adornments, it depends what that is, what those might be. Alba says she wears rings when she goes out, feel naked without them, on index and ring fingers on both hands. Yeah, so that's your own sort of like supporting your leadership, your power, your sovereignty. And what was the other finger that she said? on her index finger and ring fingers. And that's also supporting how you show up, right? So kind of putting on your glamor, putting on your like, this is how I occur, this is how I appear. So if those two are, are comfortable, that's what that would indicate. Cool, right? I think it's cool. All right. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So we could spend, so this is what, this is why it's so cool. So if we put it all together, we have these hand gestures. now. In um, the study of, of body language is called kinesics. This is the psychology, social, it, anthropology and psychology sort of came together because they were both observing these things at the same time. And, they, and so this study, um, scientific study of body language is called kinesics. And in kinesics, there's these things that are called emblems. Emblems are things that we'll see here. And they convey a word or a small phrase, but they are not American Sign Language or they're not sign language. And so you'll recognize them right away. So Melissa, you could advance. So you know what this sign is. Certainly on Facebook, it's like, but in real life, what is that? It's usually good job, right? Because you did an action, like the thumb indicates a physical action. You did a thing. You parked the car, you nailed that panel incorrectly, you laid that brick, I'm looking at John, you laid them, oh, you laid those bricks really well. John might be like, yeah, it looks good, right? It's likely that John would, or he would have folks that a thumbs up sign would be an appropriate sign. The, the rest of the fingers are held in, but what you did really mattered and that's what's being focused on. And so we emphasize the actions that you took in this hand gesture. Good job. Indicating you did a thing, you took an action. Isn't that interesting? What about the next one? Yeah, we talked about this already, right? You have violated rules, boundaries, and limits, and I am lifting Saturn to let you know. You, I put my bad karma on you. <laughs> I love that you said that 
Saturn rules karma because this is also a little bit of a curse, right? It's a little bit of a like, curse you. May you get a flat tire since you cut me off. You know, you have that thought for a minute, right? How about the next one? So peace or victory, it depends, right? And if it's palm, if you're, if the palm is facing towards you, oh wait, Alba said something about the FU symbol. I want to read it. Alba said, I will therefore call it flinging the Saturn. <laughs> That's awesome. I fling the Saturn at you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I love that. So the victory or the peace sign, if it's palm side towards you, it's peace or victory. If it's the back of the hand, in, it's in an upward motion in England, it's up yours is what that means, right? But we're looking at it from this perspective. Peace in the United States is usually what's meant this way, sometimes a victory. In England, I think it's more victory more than peace. But in either case, we can look at this being our actions are restraining ego and restraining mercury, mercurial communication. And what's standing strong is Jupiter and Saturn, leadership and authority, along with rules, boundaries, and limits. And if you think about uh, the politics around creating peace, around armistices, around stopping actions of war, those are really what are required, right? Stopping the actions of war, having a ceasefire, having agreements, um, putting, setting ego aside to some extent, being able to move on from things, being able to manage the communication, and being a stand with strong, firm leadership and strong convictions and ethics. So it's a very interesting uh, hand gesture in this way. A question Listen. for the group. Didn't Crowley claim to have invented the V for victory? Like he like put the bug into yeah, I, I believe he did at, at some point. And he, he said it was uh, to uh, represent uh, Apophis, I believe, like the sign of Apophis mm -hmm. uh, and Typhon to counteract the swastika, which is Isis, you know, from the, um, like the right. uh, invocation. Hexagram. This one and that one. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. How did, so Scott, how does the Jupiter Saturn connection, what I just said, relate for you? Um yeah, I mean to Crowley saying that, um I, for him, I think it was just the um the form of the of the sign in general. Uh, and relating it back to a, a a whole bodily form where you would raise your arms up in the air. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, it, it does it, like with a Apophis. It, he tends to be a destroyer. So, like it, it maybe with Saturn, but it, you know, it'd be. Um, that's about all all I could draw between those two. Interesting. Thank you. Maybe it's, it's is it like leadership and just and that destructive force separate from each other. Like they're if they're not in alignment. They're like we're trying to get away from that destructive energy. A lot of people see Saturn as destructive. I don't know why I've never really seen Saturn in that way. I've seen Saturn as maybe I'm just poly, am I too Pollyanna with Saturn? <laughs> well, there are a I lot just, of ways to look at it. Restriction and boundary yeah. is another way that I kind of prefer to look at it. Although I think they all have their role. Yeah, he eats the children. Yeah, well, they needed eaten. <laughs> they were delicious. I, he got this. We can't get the sauce right. Otherwise, we would have eaten them. <laughs> we are witches after all. OK. Uh, right. Another, oh, uh, Alice, that so you could, could look Go at ahead, it. Scott. Um, he's uh, restricting, so restricting with law. Uh, the, I mean, I think the the idea behind the swastika was that it was moving outward, and you know, you know, that with a lot of motion, and so restricting it uh, by putting both law and slowness on it. That could be a, a good interpretation. Yeah. 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 I just, yeah, I, I just posted that, but yeah, like, oh, 
restricting the influence and power and expansion of the Nazis, which is represented by Jupiter and with the restriction of Saturn. That's, that's something that occurred to me. Yeah, I was just going to read your comment, Elba. I thought, yeah, yeah that was cool. Awesome. Good stuff. So we move. All right, the last one. So this one is the OK symbol, right? And so we connect the crown chakras. Usually when we do that, it's the crown chakras that we connect. And, you know, this person is connecting more the third eye chakra, but connect the crown chakras in a circle. Mm -hmm. So we take the highest sort of energy, highest vibration of action and the highest vibration of our leadership. And we put those in a circle in a continuous loop that our actions and our leadership have created a loop. And we sort of relax the rest of the fingers, sort of spread, spread them out to indicate okay, right? And this is um, different from the thumbs up sim, uh, sign. The thumbs up is often, I've noticed, used with purely physical actions, but I've noticed that the okay symbol is used both with physical actions, but also with ideas or with, um, like if I'm giving a talk, someone might, and I do a sound check, they might give me the okay more than they might give me the thumbs up. So it has, it seems to be more of a nuance, like using this more when perhaps it wasn't always just the action, it required other things besides just brute force, wow. just In physical action. In your sound check, this could mean raise the levels. <laughs> so true. That. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I notice it even in, like, if there was something in a conference room or something, you know, yeah, that was good. Or there's a little bit of this, like, that was delicious. And then it moves into that was good, you know, excellent. Like, there's a nuance. But thoughts <laughs> from you guys? What do you think? I thought I heard someone else say something. Okay, well, this is a little bit of the idea. So let's move to something kind of fun to the next slide here. So the application of this, right? So we can look at hand gestures all over the place. So one of the places that I, I have a whole presentation that I've gone across the country with about looking at the hand gestures in the Rider-Waite-Smith Tarot deck. Um, the Curly deck doesn't have um, as many hand gestures in it. Um, but this, but um, Pamela Coleman Smith certainly has hands in s almost all of the Rider Waite Smith cards. So when we look at the Hierophant card, we can see that the Hierophant is making what is known as the teacher pose. But there's a difference with this teacher pose. Instead of the thumb being relaxed, like you see in most iconography of the teacher, which is where the thumb is, you know, kind of relaxed and away from the hand. The thumb is positioned here between the first and second finger. I mean, try to do that yourself with your right hand. That's not, I don't find that to be a very comfortable position. I don't know if anyone else feels that that's comfortable. If you do, maybe it says something about you. When I was given, um, when I first met um, a Tarot scholar um, and I said, I don't read Tarot, I'm only a palm reader. She said, oh, well, there's hands in the Tarot cards and handed me this card. I had no idea what the, what the Hierophant uh, represented. I just looked at the hands and I said, well, based on the hand gesture of, the hieroph of this person, I would say this person has a teacher pose, but the thumb is in between the first and second finger. And so the actions of the teacher are square exactly between authority and, and structure and limits. And so this is very traditional teaching. It's teaching that is uh, really like restrained. And <laughs> what everyone looked at me and they were like, come on, you're lying, you read Tarot. Don't stop playing with us. And I was like, really, I have no idea what does this card mean? And they're like, a teacher, traditional wisdom. And I was like, shut up. It was like Alba said, mind blown. It was amazing, right? So you can advance this slide and show the. I saw your mouse moving around. What are you doing with that mouse? 
I don't know. I'm like a cat. I'm like after the screen. <laughs> there we go. So. Yeah, so number five, the higher fan. Keep going. Yep. Oops, go back. Back. Yeah. So anyway, so that's one of the things you can do. Uh, oh, I see some links went up in the- The links chat. decided to go up after I tried to- Okay, great. So there's a bunch of links there. Yeah, okay. So Alba, <laughs> Alba said mind blown. Isn't that cool? So you can do this. So I have a presentation called um, the Tarot Palmistry Mashup that I do with Madame Pamita, um, who's the author of um, Madame Pamita's Mag Magical Tarot. And she's coming out with the Book of Candle Magic this year and um, other books soon. She's amazing in, in Los Angeles. And so we do a really great presentation of palmistry and tarot. And we presented at the Northwest Tarot Symposium. We're booked, um, we were planning to be at Reader Studio this year, but there was this pandemic that happened. So hopefully next year we'll do that. So anyway, it's a lot of fun to do this with anything, but you can do this with any iconography, right? So let's go to the next post. You can also do it with people. Perhaps there's people out in the world that are making hand gestures. So I wanna ask you all, so you can press your space bar. What do you notice about this person's hand? What's obvious to you about their hand gesture? Go ahead and press your space bar and speak up. It's open? Yeah, an <laughs> open hand, yep, definitely. And I, raised? Yeah. Sure. I feel like it's someone waving you away, like, yeah, get out of here. That's okay. <laughs> Is what about the, do you notice anything about the position of the index finger versus the other fingers? What do you notice about the index finger? Is it relaxed? Is it straight? Is it overextended? Seems pretty strong. Like it's very active. It's very stiff. It's very stiff, right? So that is an index finger that's being held straight out, right? So what would that tell you? What would that tell you, Alba, about this person? That person is holding their index finger, like, kind of like this, right? If I exaggerate, what would that tell you about? What would you say? This is, and is this their right hand or their left hand? Right hand. Well, I was asking Alba, but okay. I'm Melissa, sorry. you know the answer. Melissa, you well, know I the can answer. tell, I can look at it and I can see. I know. Sorry. But you know the answers. Alba, what do you think? Is that the right hand or left hand? I mean, yeah, the right hand. <laughs> so what is the right hand? So I'll help, Alba, you wanna play with me? Let's do this together. Okay. So Alba, does that represent their inner life or their outward life? The outward life. Yeah, that's correct. So, and what is Jupiter? What what finger is that? And the index finger is Jupiter, right? I, uh, I, I think it's Jupiter, I, I have a It heart. is, yeah. it's exactly right. And what does that represent? It represents, uh, you know, like leadership, authority, power. Yeah. So, and if it's extended, what is versus flexed? What would you say about this person's leadership or authority? Um, yeah, I feel like this hand is very authority. You know, it's it's used to having their word being law in a way. If that makes sense, like. Um, they're used to being heard. And again, I feel like this hand gesture, this person is being very dismissive. That was my first impression. Like, Oh yeah. <clears throat> so that's fine. That's a little bit of your opinion on like sort of more of the general gesture, but I like to really look at the hand position and the finger position to make sure that my own like opinions of the hand aren't blocking, right? Or aren't getting in the way. But I so, talked about the, the index finger specifically, being so stiff, it was like I was getting to that. Like it, it kind of brings home to me the fact that this person is like, no, I'm right and you're wrong, and I'm dismissing you because I'm that person is used to, you know, being hurt. Yeah. What's the most positive thing that you can think about having an index finger in this way? And remember, body language is temporary, so it's how this person is feeling in the moment that this picture is taken. What do you think would be the most positive thing you could say? If you were having a great day, Alba, and mm -hmm. your index finger was in this position, what would you say 
that day was like for you? Um, well, since Jupiter to me also represents luck and good fortune, and yes. they, they had a really lucky day that day. That's right. Yeah. This is excellent, right? They were extending their index finger. Maybe it was a really lucky day. Maybe it was an awesome day. Maybe they were in charge of what they were doing. They were in a moment of authority and sovereignty in their work, right? Mm -hmm. That is what I like to say about the hand. Whether they were domineering or overbearing on other people is something that I would say they would want to look out for, mm -hmm. but I would not put that on someone as a permanent state of being, I would say this, is a, this was a great day with your leadership. You were definitely in charge of what you were doing when this picture was taken. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for playing with me. A couple other things that I noticed about this picture, the pinky is out. I think some of you see that. That pinky is pretty strong and it's out. So there's a strong sense of communication. The middle two fingers are together. This is an interesting note. When I see the two finger, the middle two fingers together, I see this as the sun and Saturn. And so ethics and ego. So a person is identifying as an ethical or as someone whose ego and ethics or ego and structures are linked. So they identify in this way. And then the mercury is held out. So this is some of the notes on this. So the last question I have for you Oh, the thumb is open. Um, and so again, this is an active person, right? The last question is, who do you think this is? And we're not gonna advance until we get, we get a few guesses. So any guesses on who this might be? The people who know cannot tell. You are restricted. <laughs> you don't, if you don't already know the answer, chip in, what's your guess? Melissa's hand. Yeah, that'd be Is good. It? No, it's not Melissa. Free tattoo. Right. Uh, Any other guesses? I'm going to guess Kellen. No, this is a famous person. Light bulb, I won't say it. At least we'll call him semi-famous. And I gave him a gentle. <clears throat> Last chance. Anyone, any guesses? I love that you guessed Melissa Alba. That's awesome. I appreciate it because I would actually really dearly love to be associated with this person. In oh, so we know that it's not Trump. <laughs> right, right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's find You guys want to know who it is? Let's find out. You, who is he, it? He, he almost joined us on the call when I told him about this. He was really excited. <laughs> we thought this was a really cute picture because there's lots of hands doing lots of different movements. Um, so, Alba, yeah. So. When you were talking about how, you know, he might have been having an attitude, I thought, well, if he was in a photo shoot for his album cover that day, he might have been having an attitude in that moment. So going back to you, Alba, you were probably exactly right. I just, <laughs> I'm always like, okay, well, hold on with personal judgment. Let's first look at that. But yes, and it always comes back to the person who said, like, he was probably being, it was like, oh, yeah. You're totally right. <laughs> Alba says, I just found my new calling. Oh, I think so. <laughs> awesome. Are hilarious. All right. So let's look at some of the hand gestures. Oh, wait. What? Cindy says, noticing the bend in the thumb. Is that associated with energy channel? Well, okay. So that's a great question, Cindy. Thank you for asking that. So Cindy is asking about, I think, the thumb. Sorry, I can't do it. The hitchhiker thumb, it's called. So your th a thumb can be like this, or it can bend out like this. Whenever I see the thumb bent, actually, will you go back to the previous slides? We have a close-up on the hand. Sure. Um, and then you see the tip of the thumb. So you can use your mouse, Melissa, to sort of circle around the tip of the thumb there. Um, the tip of the thumb is splayed outward. In a, it's called a hitchhiker's thumb. This is indicative of someone that has a flair to the things that they do, a little artistic flair, a little extra, right? So I don't know if anyone here <laughs> happens to know a little bit or has seen Lon, but 
certainly the man has a little bit of flair, right? He goes for that little bit of extra, right? So in his actions, he's not just gonna do something, he's gonna do something with, to evoke a laugh or to, with a little bit of panache, right? And so whenever someone does that with their thumb, they're doing something with a little extra flair. Or they could be called, would any of you call Lon, he's a little bit extra? You could maybe refer to him in that way, right? Maybe, a little bit. Maybe, just a bit. So thanks for that question, Cindy, it's awesome. Right. Okay, let's get to hand positions in the Gnostic Mass. This is what we've been waiting for. Yeah. First up, so this no, is, uh, go ahead. Oh no, this is the first time in this presentation that I've seen these hand positions and Melissa and I talked about them. So we are gonna go, um, I'm gonna give you some of the perspective that I have on the hand position. Melissa will then talk about its meaning, but um, really this is a little bit of a one-way presentation. I would love it to be interactive. So add in your own observations or perspectives as we go along, just hit that space bar and pipe up. It'll be yeah. totally fine. It's just us I, friends. I absolutely agree. I would really love to get um, perspectives on it. I know a lot of the people in the group have a deep familiarity with the mass and these signs. I also want to explain for those of you who might wonder that we're not doing all of the signs and the steps and all of that um, because I showed I showed those to Jim and some of the things we do like the, the ones with movement across the body um, there wasn't any new meaning from Jim's perspective in taking a hand position and moving it so um, the signs that we are looking at are more of the stationary ones and I think that we can all extrapolate what we learn from those hand positions into the other ones that have more motion. Um, Definitely. And maybe that motion where it is on the body is significant. And I think that there's also, um, you can use what you've learned. So there'll be a handout that's made available to you through the links. And I encourage you for people who've attained you know, um, access to hand gestures that are not available to the general public, what an amazing thing to be able to look at, both the um, understanding of the hand gestures and their meaning from the book of the law, but also, and from other writings or from traditions that are handed down, but also from this perspective and knowing what the planetary associations are with the hands and your, your understanding of the planetary associations and making those connections. You can take this and run with it and it will be no end of, um, well, I guess Alba's gonna take it and run with it in this case. <laughs> okay, let's look at the first one. Oh, look at John, so handsome. <laughs> so I understand this is called the hailing sign. So the things that I see here are the fingers are held together. So I, and I just put this on my Instagram. So if you guys want to follow my Instagram, it's divine hand gym. And I just did a presentation on i I'm doing a spotlight on famous people in the media. <clears throat> Someone famous in the media right now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Anthony Fauci is the head of the COVID response for the white house. And he is um, gesturing a lot in the media with what's happening and he's pissing off the president and every time he's gesturing he's holding his hands together and it's a really interesting pattern so you can look at that and whenever i see people that come up to me for a palm reading i always have people take a picture with their hands like this this is a very important um, photograph that i use for online hand, palm readings is do give me a picture like this so i can see what your hands are doing and sometimes people give me their hands and they're like this, or like this with the thumbs. That means you're keeping it together. You're trying to keep your shit together. You're trying to keep a lid on things. You're restraining your energy, right? And in this hand gesture, what I see is restraining the energy of Jupiter, Saturn, Sun, and Mercury, right? Holding your energy, restraining your energy. The thumbs out at a 90 degree angle would say readiness to take action. So if that thumb is out, I'm restraining the energy of Jupiter, Saturn, Sun, and Mercury, but I am ready to take the right action. It's almost like the actions matter regardless of what you believe or do the action orthopraxis over ortho 
doxis, right? Uh, the practice is important and the, 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 the belief is secondary to the actual practice, something like that. So these are the things that I, um, I saw in this hand gesture. Go, Melissa. All right. So as I mentioned, we're not showing the earlier sign that happens before this, the step and sign of a man and brother, woman and sister, which uses the same hand position and goes through a motion. And I, I bring that up to, just to kind of illustrate that in the mass, step and sign happens and then the creed is stated and then this, the hailing sign is is um, used for the first time. Um, and those are, it's published in Mystery of Mystery that those are older versions of degree sensitive signs. So we're basically stating as the deacon and congregants of the mass that we are members of this community and that we are by doing the hailing sign we are prepared to the level of a magician to do this magical work in the mass. So um, the people, the congregation may not understand the significance of the sign, but they do it to enact the fact uh, that they are there and ready and present. Uh, if you consider perhaps compare this with the priest's later statement, I'm a man among men, and the line from the Book of the Law, every man and every woman is a star. Um, the Gnostic Mass is, is a part of our Gnostic Catholic Church is a universal message. So by going through these motions, we are signifying that we have prepared ourselves as siblings and as magicians to do the work. Let me see, is that all I was going to say? Yeah, I think that covers it. Does anyone out have anything to add to that? I, I like that this one has a lot of right angles in it. Mm -hmm. It was one of the things that I thought about too, is I think about, um, I, I think about astrology. Um, in palmistry, like in astrology, squares are, can be significant. When they're squares, I look at them as building blocks or ladders. They're structures. Sometimes people see them as negative. I don't tend to see them. I, I see them as neutral. They can be used in negative ways. They can be used in positive ways. I, in, if you're going to build something or climb something, you kind of need some right angles. Um, people like trines and sextiles better. I like everything. And so mm -hmm. how do we use these sort of structures of these right angles and that this is sort of indicating that there's a structure and there's a pathway and you know I, I think that that's a really cool general um, nature but in the hand itself that the thumb is at a 90 degree angle that always indicates a wide set thumb is a is indicative of I'm ready to do the work I'm ready to take the action yeah if you add on to that too the fundamental job of a magician being to manage their inner forces and to achieve equilibrium of forces that um, Crowley wrote about um, this initiational level as a man, ex the man experiences life and that union with elements within the self is the preparation and activity of a magician. So that I think dovetails nicely with your idea of the stability of squares. Uh, if you also- And managing the energy is also indicated with holding those fingers together. You are managing your energy, you're managing yourself, you're restraining in some way. People do that in the holidays. I'm always booked for holiday parties. People are always holding their hands together and I'm like, you're just trying to make it through the holidays. They're just trying to manage to make it through, right? And so that's indicative. So this is also, the positive side is trying to man, you know, managing yourself, managing your, your, your being. Also interesting to note that this sign is given at four different times in the mass. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I think we could go down a, a rabbit hole about those four times and what's happening at those four moments. Um, but food for thought for those who are. Squares have four corners. Okay. That's right. Okay, Do let's see the next one. want to add? Oh yeah, anyone want to add anything? Scott. So 
Yeah. Are you guys going to go over the, uh, you said you were going to skip the, the some of the earlier signs, but the, the Dugard sign? Yes, it's the next slide, actually. Okay. Then I will shut up. We, we and paid it does Scott. connect with this one. Yeah, we paid Scott for transitions. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some connections between the hailing sign and the Dugard. Other thoughts on the hailing sign? All right, let's move on. Dugard. So I thought this was really interesting because I was like, Melissa, what is she doing with her thumbs? <laughs> so I, had Melissa, to I had to go like, it's like this. <laughs> had to be like that. And I was like, ooh, you revealed a secret. Is it like what happens behind that red drape? <laughs> oh, the veil, which is not always red, but maybe. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I never know. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So link thumbs held loosely is what it says. So this, some of this verbiage is right out of, what is the book that you read to me? Uh, Melissa. Mystery of Mystery. Okay, great. So we were, I was taking some of this out as Melissa was reading the description, I was writing it in here. So what I see is the action. So the thumb, remember everybody, what does the thumb represent is the actions you take, right? And so your actions are restrained with each other because you're, you're, cur you're flexing your thumbs. And so you're doing this with your thumbs. So you're restraining the actions, but you have to take the action of restraint. And so what that means is if you hold everyone who's done this, this is not like your hands are in your pockets. If I want to relax, I'm going to put my hands in my pockets because then my hands are like basically asleep, right? To hold my hands in front of me with my thumbs linked requires some calories. It requires some energy. I wonder if my thumbs actually like I'm doing this and accidentally like, oops, and then I have to relink them. How many times that happens as you're in this position? So there's an, there is a, an activity or an action of restraint. And I thought that that was a very interesting, um, interesting palmistry perspective. The other thing is all the fingers are held together. Again, very similar to the, um, to the previous hand gesture. Um, but they're in a triangular shape. And so this is, again, managing or restraining the energy, but this crisscross fingers. So whenever, um, this is not a common thing that people do, but to crisscross the fingers is a little of a, of a lattice work. So it creates this energetic lattice work between the right and left fingers, sort of can seen as sort of connecting all of the chakras together creating this geometry, sacred geometry, and it's very much a spiritual protection. So when I think about how people will use this or they'll block things, they'll block something coming at them, there's this protective or, or you know, protective aspect to it. It reminds me of creating lattice works um, through which you would speak to the divine. So there's all kinds of sort of things. The triangular shape is really powerful, that it's held over um, and I think Melissa will talk about this, that it's generally our arms are at waist just below our, our hips. And so it's held, um, depending on, you know, each person, but it's held over the generative um, genital area. And so that's kind of an interesting sort of ideas that come to me from this hand sign. Mm -hmm. Did I take away some of your... No, fire? I'll just use that as a wonderful segue to say that the term do guard... Um, is derived from Freemasonry and the idea uh, it's meaning God protect. Uh, and I looked at Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, which describes it as a mode of recognition, which derives its name from an object, which is to duly guard the person using it in reference to his obligations and to the penalty for their violation. The due guard is an Americanism of the comparatively recent or of comparatively recent origin being unknown to the English and continental systems. Um, so do guard means God preserve. And has it been suggested, um, don't really have a source other than maybe an online thing and some conversations, that the position of the hands it is a representation of the Mason's apron which is a symbol of purity. So the hands are linked, as Jim 
said over the source of life and reproductive organs, symbolizing the generative force. And the thumbs, seen as phallic symbols, are held together. Uh, to continue the idea, the apron, consider purity, is that of pure and singular devotion to one's HGA, perhaps, or of the focusing of energies for magical procreation. Uh, the hands overlap in the shape of a downward facing triangle, which is the symbol of Rahor Kuit, the crowned and conquering magical child of the new Aeon. Um, we're not here to read feet, uh, but it is worth mentioning that when the feet are squared while in the dugard position, which is a comparison to the hand position of the hailing sign that we looked at on the last slide, uh, which talks about applying structure, restriction, and balance and control over our general generative or magical force. It is a little bit like a mudra of the whole body, though. You know, like the idea of the Eastern idea of a mudra, bringing that into like what's our entire body position. I really only specialize in the hands, but yeah, it's a cool thing to look at. All right, so Scott, what is your thoughts around that since you were interested in that, in that connection? I'm curious, did that bring anything up for you or any insights? Uh, no, those are all great. I was just, um, my question was going to be around the transition between the two. Um, because generally you're going to do, you know, you're, you're standing in do guard and then you go straight into giving the hailing sign. And because there's, you know, the hands are in similar positions to each other. I, w I wonder if there's uh, some connection that you could make there. So if I understand, I'm standing here in Dugard, mm -hmm. and then which hand is over my heart? Is it my right or my left? Uh, it'd be your right in this. So my right, my right hand comes up to here, and, and my left up. hand goes up like this. Mm -hmm. So I would do this for the hailing sign. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Am I doing it right? You won't eat your so liquor. Go from Dugard to that. So yeah, you're unlinking your thumb. So the difference here, I guess the, the fingers are staying pretty much the same, but one is, I'm, and the hailing sign, I'm ready to take action. And with Dugard, I stand with my actions restrained. But, so that's, it's hard for me to put my thumb at a 90 degree angle, I guess. So I bet if I was lazy at the hailing sign, I'd be like, what's up, and then, it's okay. We'll accept you're not. <laughs> we all have range of motion issues of one kind or another. Training. John. Does that answer your question, Scott? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. I was, when you were talking about the thumbs linked together, uh, the restraint of action and then the relationship with the uh, Mars and Venus and the thumb. Uh, I immediately started thinking about the sort of uh, the Rider Waite style, Golden Dawn style interpretation of the strength card. The, um, the unconscious maintaining that level of control or that, the, yeah, over the, the animal instinct. And, um, and then of course that immediately made me think of the, uh, the Thoth reinterpretation of that with the Lust Key, which has a slightly different connotation. But um, yeah, it just that was immediately went into my head was this whole sort of the idea of the powerful generative forces restrained in a way where they're working in, in a sort of a balanced way as well. Yeah. They, well, and to add to that, you're bringing the right and left hand together. And so there is this like personal, internal, reflective, you know, versus this outward you know, expressive sort of thing in general, like the world and your personal, and you're bringing those together. And here it's her, uh, what is Lisa doing? Is that her right hand is over her left? Right does guard matter? Left. I don't actually believe that that matters. Okay, so it, it would be interesting. You could read a person on whether they're putting their right hand over their left or the other way around. But in, it, in either case, the thumbs are coming together and linking and so you're sort of linking the actions, your personal actions, your public actions, your invisible actions, your visible actions, your inward thoughts, your outward sort of expression 
So you're linking those and the actions together in that way. And it's in a way sort of hiding that behind here. I don't know, it's a very cool hand gesture. So you guys can geek out on it even more given the rubric that I've provided and you know what you know about these things even more than I do. And so, it's a very cool thing to just continue to. So, so it doesn't matter really in the new guard if, if the left or the right is on top. So you would say that individually it would t say a lot about the person, about which hand is on top. Naturally, yes, they do the view guard. Like unconsciously, whatever hand they come up on top would be very- It could, yeah, Alba, it could indicate whether they're right-handed or left-handed in general, but it could also indicate if someone was sort of switching or was comfortable one way or the other, probably indicates their dominant hand usage. It could, if they're switched though, it could also indicate, um, yeah, I think it's more gonna be their dominant hand because I'm doing it the other way. And I think that's really what it's indicative of more than anything. I'm right-handed, for example, I'm just noticing immediately my left hand goes on top of my right Me too, hand. I'm right-handed and my left hand is on top. So is that the dominant hand goes on the bottom? Is that normal? I want, well, you do it and your right hand is underneath, right? Yes. And you're right-handed? Yes. Yeah, I am too. So you, I, that, I, I, we're an N of two, so we're a very small test subject. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it would be interesting. I suspect that it's probably a dominant hand thing. Okay. Um, but, so I, I retract that. I think that it's more about your dominant hand more yeah. than it is saying something. Thank you. But if someone's hand is doing like this is the thing. Like if I'm doing the Dugard and I'm doing this unconsciously, right? Then there's something going on with authority, right? Or if my pinky's out, you know, then I want to I want to communicate. So if someone is doing this in a Dugard, right? You know, you can sort of you and it's by the way, it's really weird to look at people's hands. They will notice you noticing their hands. So you gotta be sly about it. But if you notice something about someone doing something with their hands, you can be like, oh, their mercury is really going to start now. Yeah, <laughs> their mercury is doing something. I wonder if he wants to mansplain again, probably, <laughs> or something. <laughs> nice. Just trying to be funny. You are funny. <laughs> okay, let's see the next one, the next. All right, so we've seen their hands. Now we get to see them. Yay! Lisa. Descending triangle. So, thumb, so made with thumbs and forefingers compared with the Dugard. So yeah, hi Lisa, she's so awesome. And so here we have this, um, notice how the crown chakras are connected on the thumbs and the index fingers, right? On Lisa's hands, she is also connecting her crown chakras on her Saturn fingers. But what's indicated in the book that we read, that, uh, sorry, Melissa read to me, was specifically the, the indication was to do the index finger and thumbs and let the rest of the fingers fall where they it may. It specifically says fingers. It doesn't say all fingers. It doesn't say index fingers. Oh, I see. It's, yeah, I'm looking to be specific. Does any triangle? I thought it said four finger. Uh, the priestess takes the book of the law, resumes her seat, and holds it open on her breast with her two hands, making a descending triangle with, oh, you're right, you're right, the thumbs and four fingers. I misspoke. So it does say four fingers, knowing that sometimes people's index finger is very long, which means that they would be able to do something I cannot do, right? So Lisa has very long, uh, um, either very short index fingers or very long middle fingers. And so she is able to do this and connect her thumbs together, right? So in any case, however that comes together, what is happening is, and this gets into the slide with the chakras, right? So it's connecting the right and left, connecting with self as divine. So connecting that crown chakra of taking of actions of sovereignty, especially, Actions and sovereignty are what form that triangle. Um, and it's that yin-yang, actions, will with the thumb, and sovereignty of Jupiter. 
so I thought that this was really cool because it's that divine, it's that crown chakra, that div highest vibration and connecting those in that downward triangle over the book of the law on the heart. It seems like it's just like the cool, one of the coolest gestures that seems so obvious. It's screaming with symbolism. <laughs> it's screaming in a downward triangle formation. That's right. The downward triangle mouth. Is it my turn? It's your turn. Okay, so we know that this is the priestess making this gesture. She has just been set upon the summit of the earth. She's become a part of the shrine. She has taken the book of the law, the logos, to their chakra, their heart chakra, the Ayurveda. And we don't see necessarily clearly because the book is open that the cover is red. Um, and the red downward pointing triangle is... Um, special to Rahur Kweet. Uh, we also know that the path of the high priestess on the tree of life going from Tipperath to Kather, the middle pillar path of the perfected magician, uh, takes to cross the abyss, has achieved knowledge and conversation and gets to go up and experience the Godhead through that path. Uh, and the downward facing triangle is also a symbol of spiritual forces being drawn down into the physical plane. So at this point, we might consider the priestess to be that conduit of spiritual energy through the logos that is in her heart that is now being accessed on the earthly plane in the temple. So anyone have anything to add? Or what are the connections you see between the hand gesture, the palmistry, and that meaning? Are you asking me or asking everyone? No, I'm asking, yeah, them. Everyone, okay. <laughs> well, the, the downward facing triangle is specifically described in, um, in the Book of Lies. Uh, as the fire of God coming down upon the altar, which uh, again sort of uh, reinforces what you were describing, Melissa, as the, the force of the divine coming down. Uh, and uh, yeah, chapter 69. Which is cool that the chakras that are connected is the divine, is our connection with the divine. Like that's really interesting connection for me is it isn't a triangle made, you know, like, I don't know how else you could make a triangle, but it isn't like, you know, the hands are overlapping or something. It's connecting those crown chakras together, which is fascinating that it's very much a, related to divine of some sort. And if you overlay, if you choose to overlay the chakras with the tree, which not everybody likes to do, but I've seen them. Um, you can maybe make a connection between where this is in her heart, the connection with the crown and how that connects in the middle pillar to breath and, and cater. Which is literally the high priestess card. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the image that we're invoking is, is basically that, mm -hmm. that archetype of the, the, the enshrined priestess. In the tarot card, the priestess, the high priestess usually has the book of law on her lap. Um, oh, right. Put it here. Which just means our symbol's better. Of course it is. <laughs> what else? Shall we move on? All right. So here, kneeling in adoration, the hands are joined palm to palm, raised above the heads. So this is like the prayer pose, connecting all active fire aspects together. So fire aspects, I will say that um, the fire side of the hand, 
This is the palm side of the hand is fire. So we're taking the fire side of the hand where the plane of Mars is, the active side of the hand, and we're putting those together in a prayer pose. It plugs you into yourself when you do that right to left, um, places the hands also in the upper arc field. So that's our connection with the divine. Um, in this case, the thumb is out, although I don't think that that's prescribed necessarily. I think people could do a prayer pose with the thumb anywhere, but I think that I so. she must be so used to doing the gesture or the, what is that one called again? The hailing sign. The hailing sign that, that just becomes natural. But in any case, um, it's a very cool, um, I think sometimes this is also associated with uh, gratitude, you know, the uh, namaste type of um, mudra in the East. So, Melissa, your thoughts? Okay. Well, in Mystery of Mystery, we learned that this action symbolizes the joyful union of opposites. And raising the joined hands above the head symbolizes the resultant flame of illumination hovering above each person present. So we have a, a flame connection with what Jim was talking about. Uh, it's reminiscent of the flame of Pentecost, which descended upon the disciples, and of the dove that descended upon the head of Parsifal. Also of note is the association of this pose of adoration with the Hebrew letter Yod. Yod represents a flame, and its gematria, when spelled out, it's 20 and corresponds to hand. So you can imagine the deacon children and congregation with all these little flames over their heads. Uh, since the form of Yod is seen in other Hebrew letters as well, the deacon and children in their grouping of three Yods mirrors the form of the letter Shin, which represents fire and spirit. And this is just a high level description of what rabbit hole of symbolism and gematria can do. So I, I encourage you all to dig deeper on your own. Um, yeah, and you already mentioned the Hindu Anjali Mudra, so the salute of recognition of gratitude, which I have heard described as when it's like between people, like with peers, it's at your heart, when it's at your forehead, it's between you and a superior, and when it's with a deity, it's up over your head. So that's what I got. What do you guys think? Um, I don't know if it really is germane to the class. It's just, this is the first time it's ever really clicked in my head that going from the kneeling adoration position to the standing uh, in the um, hailing sign, hailing sign uh, the other ritual that I've done a whole lot besides the Gnostic Mass that includes that is Liber Samek, the invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel, where you go from a supplicative pose to an invoking pose and, and bringing that consciousness into yourself. John, is she kneeling when she, are, are people kneeling when they do this? Yes, everyone's on their knees in this pose. I see. Hmm. And then and they then rise up at, with the hailing sign. And then you stand to do the hailing sign. The yep. line on I'm which they kneeling, rise. Kneeling and then I'm standing. Got the it. deacon says, O oh, ye, O oh, my people, rise up and awake. So we go from here, rise up and awake to the standing hailing sign. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, interesting. All right, let's do the last one. Il Fico. Il Fico. So I know this as uh, Manofico, El Manofico. Um, in Italian culture, um, we use this to ward off the evil eye or to admonish someone if they've done something unlucky or um, uh, will shake our, or, or something rude, or, or it's a rude gesture to sort of like, you're, you're nasty, you're naughty, right? And so it's this um, very common um, gesture in Italy and in Italian culture, sort of uh, kind of like this, Shane, but it's more, it's, it's kind of like that, but it has a, uh, an idea because we wear a symbol of the Manofico in fact, I own one on a silver chain. You can wear it, a small symbol of it, and it's 
awarding, it wards off the evil eye, right? So it's fascinating to see this. I was surprised to see El Fico, the Monofico. Um, the, in Italian culture, it's thought to be um, uh, uh, sort of a rudimentary idea of a split fig or uh, the clitoris gesture kind of through the fingers. Um, so it's thought it's uh, a obscene sort of gesture. Um, so in this case, when I look at the palmistry of it, the thumb, you all know what the thumb is now, right? Actions. And the actions are thrust in between sovereignty and, and, and restraint, right? So actions are expansion and restraint. So these two opposites on either side. Um, and they're sort of restrained. Like there's a little bit of this, like the action is trying to thrust through, right? Um, I kind of saw this as you shall not do something like there's these social constraints because I think about how it's used in society. Like, Hey, you, but I think it's also, you did it anyway. Like you did something and I'm reminding you that you have, th your actions have thrust through those two pillars of Jupiter and Saturn. And it's interesting that that's held in this sort of way here. So I for totally forgot what this means in the Gnostic Mass. You'll have to tell me again, because I can't remember if that, <laughs> does it even relate? Does that, what I, I say think, even relate? I think it does. I've been thinking a lot about this since we originally talked through this earlier this week. Um, oh wait, Alba said, similar to a fetish Afro-Caribbean cultures wear, a little black ebony fist to protect babies from the evil eye. Yes, definitely. And I think that is actually where it became popular in, in Italy was through the Mediterranean from Africa, because I think that those are connected in that way. And you see, you see those little fists carved out of coral or black ebony, and it's a very common thing. So it comes from, you know, this, uh, we believe this Af from Africa. And then again in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So what I've been musing over this is that we have we use this hand gesture. It's not always two together like that. That's just the the, the pose I chose to photograph. Uh, it's used in a couple of different ways in the mass. First of all, it's the gesture the priest takes, whether hands are together apart. Uh, always between index and medius whenever he is not holding the lance. So that's pretty much through the whole mass except when his hands are busy. Um, it was pointed out to me that it doesn't actually say that the fingers have to be closed. However, um, the work that I've been studying calls out il fico as a symbol. So I'm gonna go with that. Um, so I would compare it maybe to our do guard as the position that the congregants take whenever they're standing and not doing another gesture. Uh, there's something about it, perhaps protective, perhaps similar. We'll get into that in a second. Um, the other spot that it is used is by the deacon in this, the fifth collect, the saints. And they use that thumb between index and medius to make equal arm crosses, one cross for each of the saint names in those invocations of the saints. Um, now, a little side note into yod is correspond to the hand, as we said in the last slide. Cough is related to the palm of the hand. Um, and Lon Milo Duquette, to bring him up again, describes that in his Chicken Kabbalah. Cough even looks like the profile of a hand opening to grasp something. The hand, um, the thumb forming the base, the hand of Yod in the process of creation. Cough is associated with Jupiter and the Wheel of Fortune. Uh, so with all that we have learned thus far about the thumb, I'm sure most of you can grasp the implications. Grasp. I see what you did there. I see what I did there. Um, now, the fact, what you said, Jim, about the FICO being this kind of like warding off, banishing of evil, evil eye. 
um, makes me wonder if this was, we're using it in a kind of purposeful reappropriation, like we do often with our Christian symbols and our other um, uh, superstitious type things that we repackage them in some manner. Uh, in Mystery of Mystery, under the piece on Il Fico, um, they talk about in the Mediterranean, it's used as a defense against the evil eye and is generally understood to refer to the female generative organ, the display of which has the power to fascinate or absorb the phallic nature of the evil eye. So it's like, look, a distraction. Look, it's feminine stuff. Go away. <laughs> Uh, so the, this, as a, as a symbol of the feminine organ, then has a natural association with Babylon, with Bina. Um, also, American Sign Language, this is the letter T, uh, represents the Tau cross, and the Tau is the letter in Hebrew, which means mark cross or signature, it could mean to sign off or to witness. Aleph and Tau, the first and last letters of the alphabet, uh, are equivalent, say, to Alpha and Omega. And the first, middle, and last letters of Hebrew alphabet form the word that means truth. So if we perhaps encapsulate that T word into our Tau hand, we are invoking something else. We are banishing superstition and we are invoking truth. It's kind of like there's no accidents. Kind Isn't of. it amazing? It's uh, such a... It's yeah. Annoying. The crosses that are being made by the deacon in Il Fico are equal arm crosses, one for each state, saint name. Uh, the fourfold shape, again, fourfold, being a symbol of the four cardinal points, the elements, uh, also of uh, the pentagram through the fifth point in the conjunction of the cross, uh, and is also identified by the priest before the opening of the veil as the sign of light. So we can see this cross as a gesture of consecration or invocation, the manifestation of light or truth. Yeah. I like what John said in the chat, but I'd love for you to say it, John, because I think it's really cool. Spacebar's your friend. Spacebar's your friend. Spacebar done. No. I had to close there. the chat because I was just putting spaces on the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> so what I said was if you look at the Jupiter finger as the pillar of mercy and the Saturn finger as the pillar of severity, that the active finger in between them represents traversing the middle path, traveling up from that central path, like we were talking about with regard to uh, the position of the priestess on the altar a little bit ago. All right. So I, I feel like a little, I feel like a little lobster on a pathway towards the moon. Uh, anyway. Uh, well, you might, yeah, that works too. So we're saying <laughs> that we're taking our will and our phallus, phallic symbol and we're thrusting it, as Jim said a moment ago, through the veil, like, you just did as the priest. Well, I think and it's interesting that you say that this is something that's held by the priest, and you m mentioned something about the priest like magician, right? And I think that that's a very, did you say something like that? Uh, well, everyone in the room. Everyone, yeah. The magician, by virtue of the hailing sign, we're ready to do the magical work. Yeah. We are, as we've talked about in the earlier signs, we're constraining and controlling our magical energies to focus yeah. its magical working. Now the priest is enacting the right for the group. Yeah. His part. It is really, I think that John is really powerful that our actions are being thrust through those two pillars that our will is through there. That is really a powerful symbol. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. So. Taking all this stuff together, I think it's a really cool thing to ponder. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. And well, I'm curious if anyone else. Oh, has yes. What else do people? What are the other thoughts from people? Unmute yourself. Pitch in. 
Oh, stone. We've Was this, is this cool so far? Are you guys, what's inspiring? My prompt to you all is what has inspired you so far from looking at these hand gestures? That's what I really want to know. Oh, John's signing off. Oh, bye, John. He's got a meeting. Yeah, I guess we are scheduled to go till three. Yeah, the rest, the most of that last hour is Q&A if we want it, so. Yeah, we have a few more slides we can get to. So let's mm -hmm. get to those and then we can All do right. Q&A. So what now? Guess what? You can do magic. Oh, you already know that because you're a magician. All right, let's see how we do that. So at a very basic level, let's say you're feeling unmotivated, right? Your thumb is probably going to be in a very neutral position. So you can use this for yourself to feel more motivated, before we advance the slide, I bet you, you already know what to do, right? If you wanna feel motivated, if you wanna get yourself going, the biofeedback hack to your brain to feel motivated is to open up your thumb. So you can just open your thumb and you will be unable to sit still for very long. It is an amazing hack to your brain. And it also is why I'm calling this the modern mudras, because you can take that, that action and then create an energetic, a change in your energetic state of being just by doing that action. Isn't that a very cool idea? Another example, for instance, is the next slide. If you're acting overbearing, perhaps your index finger is hyperextended right or extended and you're in a state where you realize you know i really need to be partnering with people i need to not be leading i need to be more quiet and collaborate more you can be conscious about that and relax your index finger draw it in and flex your index finger to be more open to collaboration and partnering with other people so you can do this with any of your fingers and you can simply look at your hand gesture and ask yourself, does my hand gesture match my will? What I, what I wish to have happen, what I want to do, what I want to have in my life. And if it doesn't change your hand position, your body will follow suit. Uh, Q and A. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to tell you is I'm also teaching a class on palmistry. Registration ends today, unfortunately. So. If you want to do that, um, you can find that on my website. It's a three hour course. You will be able to read palms after that course. It's um, similar to this, but we get into more. We cover the lines and lots of practice with each other. So if you're interested in that, you can contact me. Um, and that's that. So now you can ask me any question you like. And Melissa, maybe you can dispense with the uh, um, presentation. Our so presentation. See, all, see all the peeps. See all the faces. All right, ask anything. What was inspiring to you? Melissa, what was the inspiring, most inspiring thing for you? I really had fun riffing with you about the mass hand positions and the connections that that gave me a little bit. It was interesting to see in some cases how it really supported my understanding of those symbols as we use them and then other areas where it was like, not quite the same and you know how they were different think about why that yeah. was really fun. hopefully it can add a little something to it uh alba says mass hands <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like jazz hands right and kellen if anybody says, mm -hmm. oh go ahead kellen asked can you explain how your method differs from traditional palmistry yeah traditional palmistry which is most of the books that i have here um focuses on uh, it, it's not so dissimilar. Uh, the associations with the fi with the finger mounts, the uh, the meaning of the lines are the same. It's the way that I choose to interpret them. So in many of the books, the different the difference is in many of the books, um, one particular formation is seen as negative, and another formation is seen as positive. And in the divine hand method. There is nothing that is negative or positive. Everything is neutral. And so you have the ability, meaning everything has its most positive expression 
and everything has its most negative expression, and those are subjective terms, for you. And so the divine hand method uh, has reframed the entire encyclopedia of palmistry into things that are that you can be empowered over. And so an example of that is if, for instance, you have the um, formation of a single line across the top of your palm, instead of having a heart line and a headline as two separate lines, if you just have one line across your palm, that's known as a simian line, and it is just one line across. That in traditional palmistry books is seen as the suicide line or a very negative trait associated with uh, monkeys or apes and with uh, people with um, uh, intellectual disparities. In the divine hand method, this is seen as uh, an amazing source of integrity, of a merging of your head and your heart together. We've evolved beyond the uh, Victorian era of when that was originally written about and interpreted to the modern area where we see that that is a source of integrity that is encoded into your body and can be used in amazing ways. It also does present challenges because our modern, not because the person is challenged, but because our modern society doesn't always uh, appreciate the strengths of that person. And so we look to find ways in which the things that are in the hand can be best used to find for that person's highest and best being. And that's the major difference between the divine hand method and traditional palmistry. Does that, Kellen, does that answer your question? Yeah, that clarifies it. Thank you. So it's more a, a divergence of viewpoint than like content, so to speak. Yeah, a lot of the, like, is the heart line still the heart line? Yes. Is the uh, fate line still the fate line? Yes. But what does the fate line mean and how do we interpret it? That is the major difference. And actually that's, so the, the so I would say the anatomy, the metaphysical anatomy of the hand is pretty much the same, but how it's interpreted is radically different and that matters because traditional palmistry can really harm people. I've had clients come to me and they say, a palm reader told me that my husband would die after our fifth year of marriage. And you know, that lady had been married for 10 years and she said, I have been terrified that he's going to die every day and I can't stand it anymore. And I thought, what a terrible curse or self-fulfilling prophecy that that palm reader put on that poor client. I couldn't see anything like that in her hand. And I, I don't understand how someone could say something like that. If there was, let's say the palm reader did see something like that, the more appropriate, more responsible way to say something is, what, what challenges do, do you have in your relationship at five years? And some people would say the fact that she said that kept it from happening. Um, and really it is up for, to the client to put the, site, the reading in perspective but it really bothered her. And I thought, you know, it was really helpful to help her clear that and help her, you know, those five years are over, that didn't happen. What is this about? Why are you holding on to it? So th these are the types of things that, that I do differently and that I teach people to do differently. Thank you. It isn't, it also is not an easy reading. I think the interesting thing is, people think that I'm a Pollyanna or something, but really the hardest readings to get are the readings that tell you that you are amazing or that you are divine or that you are, that you can be so much more. The easy readings are the readings that tell you, you know, you suck or you're going to die or you have a, this awful thing in your hand. Then you're like, oh good, it's not my fault. I knew it. I don't have to do anything, right? The hard readings are, no, you're amazing. Step up, right? That reminds me of what little I know of the Lama, like every person is, is you know, is div divine or is a god or is a goddess or is a star, those kind of ideas, right? And that we can step into our will and manifest that into the world. So that's very much in line with my personal beliefs and, and the method as well. Okay, enough about that. What other questions do you guys have? Or what'd you learn that you didn't know before? Uh, so a uh, question, maybe you covered it, um, but uh, so 
the attribution of the planets to the fingers that you have. Um, do you know the source of that? Like, um, does it go back in a certain tradition or? Most palmistry books would have that same association with the fingers. So the mounts are pretty much on, you know, are pretty standard with most palmistry. So in all the, you know, I can even take any random sculpture from my um, shelf and you'll see the mounts are labeled with mm. the planetary associations. And then I have extended that to be the entire finger, but that's what a lot of palmists will do as well. So really I can take any one of these books and open it up and those mounts are pretty much standard. Um, do you know if it goes farther back uh, through um, uh, beyond palmistry, like like what do, have you ever looked at like where the oldest source of that is or um... yeah I I haven't really gone to the historical sort of like where does palmistry there's um, some folks that have attempted to do that it's a little it gets a little sketch um, there is a record of palmistry back to the Vedic and Chinese um, as a as a way to do divination. Really, it, I think stems all back to you know China um, and to India, and so in those in and in the Indi India has different names for the planets, but the associations are the same. Um, I mean, they associate the planets in the same order, but Vedic palmistry is different from Western palmistry. So there was a divergence from the Eastern palm ways of doing palmistry and the Western ways of doing palmistry, just like astrology is different. And so this, I think, probably goes back to alchemy and other things like that. But I have not um, been so interested in that sort of thing because I've been uh, interested more in the applicability today. So if I was really, truly a scholar of it, I would be better at it rather than just a person that does it a lot. Sure. So. Uh, yeah, the, the reason I was asking, there's um, like, very as you mentioned there's various traditions where various body parts are very you know planets or zodiacal things or i was just wondering if you're if you knew if your system that uh, in palmistry in general was based on one of those or that's sort of yeah thing. no cool. it's i don't i don't know that for sure i'm sorry cool. it'd be a cool thing to do more research on there's like and it just shows you scott there's never any end of things to research and make associations right? with i was like ju i just had a um uh astrology reading from jen zart if you guys know her she's amazing and she said oh yeah you're midheaven i'm like what's my midheaven she's like oh it's your career and it's gemini which rules the hands i was like what <laughs> my career should be in something involving the hands that's weird <laughs> so like it never ends like there's always something that associates with, and i'm just like but yeah, that's um, awesome. I, that would be a cool thing to study. Cool. Any other questions, things that people are curious about? Things people were inspired by? Alba, you want to take on palmistry now? She's going to be our palm reader. I will say, I mean, I've had palm readings before, but I've never really been that interested. But like, this is pretty fascinating. Um, <laughs> oh, like, I find that it demystified. I mean, it, you didn't get into the lines and all that, of course, but like, it demystified it a little for me. It's like just just with the planetary aspects of the fingers, that was really interesting to me because I do a lot of planetary magic, so that was pretty fascinating uh, for me. Yeah, one of the things, and maybe Scott, this is something that you can get out on too, is I think about like that show, The Magicians, how they use like hand gestures to cast magical spells. And I think about the Gnostic Mass as hand gestures and I'm like, oh my gosh, this can be part of ritual. Like we can design a ritual or design something and say, I actually want to take advantage of my, I wanna balance my personal self with the divine actions of my outward self. And so I'm gonna put my crown chakras into my third chakras 
and then I'm going to connect my actions and I'm going to do these hand gestures or who knows what you could create by looking well, out on this, right? Ceremonial magic has so much in the catalog in terms of, of prescribed ritual gesture. Ooh. It could have gone way longer. <laughs> I never really wanted to be a ceremonial magician until now. Until you said that. <laughs> so uh, one source, and I'm, I'm just recalling this now uh, as my brain's waking up a little bit more, uh, well into the afternoon, but <laughs> um, the Golden Dawn has a different method of uh, attribution to the fingers. They do the, um, uh, the elements. So uh, the thumb is spirit. Uh, the index water, the medius fire, um, the ring finger would be earth, and the pinky would be air. Mm. And so, like, you, you often hear um, a lot of our signs described in those contexts. So when they're doing thumb, it's all about the spirit, and your, your, which way your spirit's going, and all, you know, all this sort of thing. Or, you know, if your spirit's between, uh, what would it be, water and fire... You know, you know, meaning certain things, and um, and Crowley was definitely influenced a lot by that. But uh, you know, Crowley didn't invent the uh, the Masonic signs that we're using, so <laughs> it doesn't necessarily right. feed back into those. Um, right. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So that's probably where some of the symbolism might even like like I haven't associated the fingers with elements on purpose. That um, I look at the elements in the hand, in palmistry, in the shape of the hand. So people have different element types of hands based on their shape. So people with long hands have water hands, people with short stubby hands have earth hands, et cetera, et cetera. So there are four element hands and then there's combinations of them that we have uh, specified. So that is a whole nother <clears throat> aspect of that. So- Interesting. The, the fingers, because the, pl the planetary, because I'm really focused on the planetary association with the fingers and it doesn't really balance out with the elements, I haven't, under, I haven't really made that connection with the elements. And really, I kind of see ev everyone has all four elements in their hands to one extent or another, but there's just one that tends to be dominant in their hands. So it's an interesting thing when you take if someone has associated like the five elements um, with spirit um, in the hand, it, that's a, I think that would be a different system than what palmistry has been using forever, right? So every, it doesn't matter what book I've picked up, all the palmistry books have always associated the, the seven, yeah, the seven planets on the hand in the specific ways. Sure, and the, it, it's hard to say where the Golden Dawn got their stuff. Um, they're sure. pretty famous for just randomly doing stuff. They're like, oh, it's <laughs> five things, five elements, you know. Uh, right. But they another place to look would be Agrippa um, in his magic book has a lot of, there's a whole chapter on the notes of numbers placed in certain gesturings, and he mm. goes through different gestures you can do and what he doesn't say where his source is so it's <laughs> right it could just be another random thing but uh, again yeah. it's a, a endless uh an endless uh research um project yeah i do know that the planet the associations of the mounts and planes on the on the palm can be traced back because it's in so many books i know there's possible to find that train um not, I'm not trying to defend it, and it sounds a little bit defensive, but I think that there's just different systems and that's really awesome where they come from. Sure. One other elemental thing that I forgot to mention that is a little bit of a bonus thing for the people that are left is, this is just kind of a trip, the four sides of the hands um, are associated with the four elements. And this, oh my God, Alba, you need to, this will blow your mind, Alba. Um, so this blew my mind. So when I was doing the tarot palmistry mashup, I have already known that the four sides of the hands are associated with four elements. And I was looking at um, Pamela Coleman Smith's renderings of the aces. And I just about fell over when I realized 
that she drew and she was not a palm reader and she certainly didn't know this method. The palms, palmer side of the hand is fire. And when you look at her holding the wand, the wand is the fire side of the hand is facing out and the thumb is in an active fiery position. When um, the, the mercurial side, the percussive side of the hand where mercury and the moon are, that's the water side of the hand here. And the cup is being held. And I think it's actually this way with the left hand. It's the mercury side that's facing out. And this is true on all the cards. The swords, it's the back of the hand and the back of the hand is air. We flash the, the finger through the air. We let someone know our thoughts about them. And this is the air side of the hand, or I know something like the back of my hand, right? It's the air side of the hand. And the earth side of the hand is the thumb. The thumb side, that's where I would grip something and grab something. And so when you look at the coins or the, or the pentacles, it's this side facing with that big pentacle being held there. Absolutely blew my mind when I saw that those four, yeah, exactly. When you see those four aces from the Rider Waite Smith deck, and you see that those four sides of the hands are facing and they totally match the four elemental sides of the hands, it's like, it's a, it's a trip. Melissa, you put a link in the, oh, Alba says she's looking at her tarot app right now, checking out the Rider Waite Smith deck. Isn't that cool, Alba? Aren't you just like, what? Yeah. I'm not trying to end a conversation. We can go on as long as anybody wants. So at least. Oh, yeah, can... donate. If uh, you haven't donate donated button. for this. And um, now that I'm not presenting, I can actually create links. And... Yeah, if you, if you found this valuable, please donate. Any donation doesn't go to me. It goes to Horizon. Horizon. Lodge. Lodge. And we do have an active link now to the handout. Uh, handout, get get it? Get it? Hand, okay. Handout. I'll stop uh, with my dad jokes. Grandpa jokes. <laughs> um, yeah, Alba, that is a, one of the coolest slides that we did in our tarot palmistry mashup as we go through. We looked at the devil card. We looked at the pages and their relationship to the um, to the fool card and really only through looking at the hand gestures and it's just amazing to see that and I don't know it's just a trip because um, it right she says I'm dizzy just thinking about it and it's true you really can just get geeked out on it and so there's I think there's just it isn't that it um, and this is a great thing, like Scott, you brought up, like there's these different systems that sort of come into play. Sometimes it can be too many systems and you gotta kind of pick one to keep the purity or the focus. But I think that sometimes different perspectives can bring a, uh, can reveal, I think the nature of a symbol is that the symbolic meanings continue to unfold sort of like a lotus flower. And so if you can bring the rubric, not my interpretations of it, because those are very limited and they're based on someone who is not in the OTO, I'm not part of Horizon Lodge, but bring your own understanding and research of the symbols of the symbolism of these planets and the sort of like when we're active, where our fingers are like this and when we're uh, reflexive, reflective, our fingers are like this, and then use your own intuition, your own, not intuition even, your own observation to look at hand gestures. It is another way to sort of add more in interpreting and revealing the secrets of some of those symbols. And I think the coolest one was really the Manofico, right? The Elfico, when you see like that whole sort of thing playing out with all those different connections that seem to come back around to each other. So that's the kind of thing that I think is really, really cool. So thank you everyone for being here. This was super fun. Thank you, Jim. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, I hope everyone got out of this. I'm gonna stop recording. It's nothing more fun than a super geek out with a bunch of ceremonial magicians. I don't know who else would do it for this long, right? Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, all the, 